Okay, we are just going to get started. It is a pleasure to introduce Eric Helberg, CEO of Clarkson Plateau Securities, uh, who will lead the discussion of our crude tanker panel. Thank you, Eric. Whoa. Applause before we started. That's great. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, it's time for the big one, finally, the crude tanker panel. Uh, and for me, well, first of all, when I was asked to moderate the panel, I was actually thrilled. I said yes immediately because for me, this is what Marine Money is all about, is actually discussing markets where you can make some serious money, like serious money. And I'm, we're talking, and I'm talking about investments, not speculation. This is all about risk reward, which brings me I don't know, 20 something year back when I used to be an equity analyst um, in consumer goods. Jesus, that was boring. So when I finally had the opportunity to go to shipping, I was thrilled and I haven't been able to get out of it since because the opportunities are obviously huge. That's why we, we look at them. The downside is obviously huge as well, you know, if you're unlucky with timing, etc. But this time, right now, in this space, the fundamentals are just too good, way too good. And we'll go through and discuss that a bit. So first of all, I'm, I'm obviously thrilled to have this uh, great gang of super smart tanker owners and operators on the panel. Leon Petitzas, owner principal of Atlas Maritime, predominantly in Aframaxis. Uh, Bob Burke, to the far right for you. Um, CEO, Ridgebury Tankers. In crude, predominantly Suez Maxis. And then in the middle, Sven Moxnes, Hartfjell, CEO of DHT, only VLCCs. And public, so you must have a tough skin. Um, before we, we go on to the discussions, I just want to state some facts. Uh, and the first one is obvious, but it can't be stated enough. And that is, demand for energy is growing. We're consuming more oil. We need more oil, period. Period. And as Andrea Suman Powell said this morning, which was, I think, a very interesting discussion, Energy is obviously much more recession resilient. The human species, you know, wants to thrive and grow. And in order to prosper and thrive and grow, we need energy. Uh, so the first one. And oil is going to be here for a long time still. Secondly, we've heard it repeatedly, but we have to repeat it. The order book is super low, like ridiculously low. And on tankers, it's so low we can't even see it. The dark blue, made it dark blue. In other words, the supply side that historically has, has destroyed every good market is as low as it has pretty much ever been. And as was also discussed on the product tanker panel, even if you wanted to, you cannot destroy it because yard capacity is down significantly from 551 XC yards at peak to now, what, 238. The biggest builder of product tankers, not crude, but product tankers, is bankrupt. doesn't exist anymore. The Korean yards, actually, the product tanker panel should have thanked the offshore industry because they're the ones that bankrupted all the yards and billions of dollars that need to be put into that industry. We obviously have to thank the container ship owners, which take the berths that you're supposed to use. So we can't even destroy it, even if we wanted to. And when the need to order new ships, because the time when you have to order some more ships will come and is coming. 
because they don't last forever, right? They become scrap. So you have to build from time to time, and consequently there is a demand that is there that needs to be met. Obviously there's new regulations, we haven't done it yet. So when the demand is higher than the yellow line, prices go up. So they won't go down anytime soon, they will stay up because yards don't even want to take uh, tanker orders at the moment. They don't want to lose more money on that. So my first question to you, Leon, is apparently, th despite the fact that you're private, apparently I've heard you've ordered some Affirmaxes. Why did you do that? <laughs> So back in uh, the middle of the pandemic, in November 2020, when uh, everybody thought the world is coming to an end, we ordered five Aframaxes at the bottom of the market, 20-year historical low for $45 million per vessel. And now we recently sold two for 61, so it was a great investment. When we were ordering the ships, it was counter-cyclical. We knew that the order book was super low, we knew that demand for oil is gonna come back. The sector was kind of neglected. Nobody invested in uh, drilling. And um, we thought it was uh, really attractive fundamentals. So we're very happy with the investment. We believe in the crude sector. And we also think that uh, demand for oil is gonna go higher. Uh, supply is not there. So the market is really tight and crew tankers will benefit over the next uh, few years. Good, sounds like a smart move. Um, Svein, you just sold off some older ladies. So now it's off to the races, on the plane, spend some fuel and go to Korea, or? No, no, we're not gonna order anything. So the prices are just way off, so. Um, but you know, um, these the ships that we sold last year were, uh, they were 16 years old last year, and the ships we sold now was 115, 116 year old. And it's not that easy to sell all the tankers because the counterparties that you meet are all, not all sort of a good character, if I, if I may use that word. Um, so I, I, I bought ships from you. Yeah, but you're, you're <laughs> the good guy, Bob. Uh, you didn't show up this time, right? So, so. Um, and you need to, go on, go on, of, go on, tell <laughs> in order to do a deal, you have to leave some table, uh, some money on the table for the next guy also, right? So these are good ships. I think we got very good prices. The ships that we just sold now in this quarter, we bought them eight years ago, two ships. They were in a distressed situation. We paid $98 million for them eight years ago. They have two big upcycles with them, and we sold them now for 78. I think that's pretty good business, frankly. So. Uh, <laughs> So I'm not sort of shy of also selling ships, but um, we bought two five-year-olds last year. Great price, eco ships with scrubbers. We wanted to buy more, but prices just, uh, you know, rocket up too quickly. So we decided to take a step back. So I think the best thing I would do today is to buy my own stock, frankly. So, so buy my own ships at sort of a very good price compared to ordering new buildings at 120. That will not happen. Bob? We got buying, we got selling. I'm still recovering, excuse me. I can <laughs> sell you another if you want. <laughs> and he, he obviously have, you know, nice fleet of Suez Maxis. We'll, I'll go through some interesting characteristics of, of that uh, age bracket you're in, but you know, any, uh, any thoughts about new building market? Yeah, we, um, we have always bought second-hand vessels. Uh, you know, we'd rather have the lower capital cost and the higher operational upside. And I think our, our day is sort of coming. You know, you talk, everyone talks about suddenly it's transition. And a year or so ago or less, it was, you know, how do we get rid of all energy? And I think folks, it was easy to say that politically, economically, uh, banks, investors, universities, endowments, uh, funds, uh, let's go green, let's go green, and just avoid oil altogether. Do not invest in oil. Oil is bad, oil is bad. And that's easy when the world is long commodities, which it has been for a long time but suddenly we're not long commodities anymore. And I think everyone in this room saw what was gonna happen, but it's like, you know, a lot of these cycles, you, you wait for it to change gradually, but it never does. There's always a snap and something happens. And like most things, it's something unforeseen. I mean, the, the last two big events in, in, our, in our, in the world, in our world, after everyone does their analysis and, and the, the graphs, the graphs and everything else were completely unseen. It was COVID and, and the war. So, um, you know, the world was caught short and, uh, 
suddenly we need oil, oil is moving further, and all the ships are needed. And as far as transition goes, you know, we have all the vessels, and as your graph shows, there's a huge amount of vessels that are approaching or passing 15 years, and the world's going to need those. And as you pointed out and we discussed, the yards are really expensive, the yards are in trouble, they're booked out a couple years, steel prices are moving up, they don't want to contract. As Swine said, they will not contract out two or three years, they don't want to quote. So I, I, um, I, I always hesitate to say it's different this time because no one likes to say that. Um, so maybe paradigm shift, which might be closer. Anyway, I think it's, uh, I think it's all in our favor. Unless something completely unprecedented. Another thing I wanted to touch upon is trade patterns <coughs> are changing. So Russia, who is the second biggest oil producer in the world, used to export all this oil to Europe. This was a three-day trip. Now Russia is exporting all this oil to China and India. So tone miles are increasing exponentially and you know triple or quadruple the amount of ships are needed. That's why rates are going up. And uh, what we're seeing is that Europe needs to import more oil from the United States, from South America and from the Middle East. So the trade patterns have changed, tone miles have increased and this is really, really good for tankers. And then another thing that we're seeing is no new building orders for VLCCs after 2024. Most of the yards, like we discussed, are booked with containers, LNGs. So the order book is really low. The vessels, the new building vessels are becoming more expensive. So the owners are not really incentivized to order. And we think that um, oil demand will continue to go up, especially with the price of oil at 120 people will n require more oil. They will need more energy. And it's not about, you know, fossil fuels anymore. It's all about energy security. So we think we're in the right sector. Great, good, agree. Um, yes, to, to that point exactly. So obviously, dislocation of Russian oil has predominantly been a positive for the Suzmax and the Athermax trade uh, so far. Uh, but obviously, with the increased production we're seeing, obviously in the Atlantic in particular, as we can see, the distance from obviously the US or the Atlantic to China, which obviously is the biggest buyer, and that will emerge as they come move out of their current uh, heavy lockdowns. At some point, they will. You know, it's a massive, obviously, distance, uh, which will help uh, the market improve. Just going back a bit here quickly, because we were discussing capital allocation to some degree. Uh, obviously, there are new regulations coming you know, on stream next year. And all your fleets obviously are you know, very good, and the tanker market, or the crude tanker space in general will be pretty much OK, you know, as you can see to the left. Uh, it's pretty much the red dots that have to do something or scrap their ships. Uh, but the gray bars, they obviously have to do something. And predominantly, that means slowing down. So Bob, you obviously have you know, a fleet of you know, somewhat more vintage ladies. Are you seeing any challenges with that in the current market in trading them? What are your, what are your thoughts you know, the next three years? Not the next 20 years, forget that, the next three. Uh, we don't really, I mean, the ships generally don't go, we, we did analysis on all our vessels, and it is very, very rare that they would go uh, so fast that we'd have to slow them down. So we, we, we see very little uh, reduced capacity in our fleet. We, we back tested over the past several years to see when the, uh, the speed would be a problem. You have to keep in mind, and which is the case with the, you know, all the ships that we have that are non-eco is they have very big engines. So when you now go and derate, we derate them from 17 and a half, 18 knots down to 15 and a half knots. And the service speed in the industry is 12 and a half and 13 knots. So you don't take any commercial capacity out of at least the fleet that we have. And I think this would mirror those of many other owners in, the, in, in a similar position. So it is a bit different to dry cargo where you don't have the same sort of, you know, extra power capacity hidden in the ship that uh, what you have in large tankers. But beyond 2026, it becomes uh, an issue, right? So the, you will have ships of the sort of prior generations. They will have to do something, <coughs> slow down, or disappear. Yeah, we, we 
back tested, de they looking at derating the ships and back testing over three years. I think it was two or three occasions the ships would have would be compelled to slow down beyond what they would have done because of what Svein said, the service speed is slow. But there will be something sort of like a derating of uh, the engines of the older vessels, and that means they won't be able to speed up. <clears throat> so if there is a speed limit and the vessels need to sail at 12 knots or maybe less, that's very good for the supply situation. It means less vessels around, higher demand for cargoes, and that's very good for rates. What it does is it puts a, a, a tap, a top on the limits the capacity of the market when it's really, really hot. So we can't go 15 knots if the market's strong, which you may do in a really hot market. So it, that's all it does. To reduce productivity, right? So. Okay, excellent. So I think we've, we, we've definitely uh, made sure. Oh, other way. Sorry for that. You told us you had three slides. <laughs> Last one. Um, we've made a point on the supply side, I hope, because as you mentioned, so look at it, VLCCs this year, 47 ships. So, you know, it's a pretty, you know, grown up number. Let's, let's, let's call it that. Next year, 20 with obviously the possibility of slowing down as we discussed. 24, zero, 25, zero, zilch, nada. So in other words, we don't have to, you don't, we, all of us, we don't have to be that massively enthusiastic about the demand side in, in order for this to be a really, really, really interesting and constructive market. Which brings us to the demand side, the market, right? Which has always been my, you know, are we going to see some more oil come to the market? And I'm thrilled to say, earlier this week, we had a, an offshore, like a large offshore call, went through the market. We are seeing unheard of, unheard of tendering activity in the Middle East. Never been higher. Saudi Aramco is going to double their rig count this year from 50 rigs they're now to 80 rigs, and they want to go to 100 rigs. Why? Because the national oil companies in the Middle East have now understood that this is a phenomenal opportunity for them. They don't have shareholders they need to answer to with regards to ESG. They're going to pump oil, make money, get revenues, and have great budgets. And that's what we're seeing in the market today. So on the demand side, guys. What do you think? After listening to you, we want to buy more ships. <laughs> <laughs> Old ones, uh, not new ones, right? I, I think Eric, what you talk about here is, of course, very important. But for those of you who were er earlier listening to the product tanker panel, right? This is just the queue. You cannot have a dislocation where product tankers on average are earning $50,000 a day and the crude market not happening. And this is at a time where Oil inventories have not been as low since seven eight years back. So at some point, something's going to give. And I have a hard time to explaining or trying to analyze or find out why the product tanker should give. There will be more feedstock moved into the refiners. So it's a question of time. I can't tell you whether this you know, crude market is going to turn in you know, August or November or January, but I don't think it's very far off. And when it turns, it's going to be like the ketchup bottle that you've been shaking a bit too many times. And it's going to come out super quickly, like what we have seen also in the past. So I think this is the best cue. If you, if you really see what's going on in products and accept what the, the guy is saying, and I think it's all credible analysis behind it. Crude is sort of a thing that will move next. And buy the stocks, don't ships. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, you agree? You know, I, I agree. And one more thing about the uh, supply side before we start backslapping ourselves. Um, I mean, this is a discipline that's been enforced upon us by the capital markets, both on the shipping side and on the, on the energy side. We've been forced not to invest. The money hasn't been there. So, I mean, as a, like any other industry made up of human beings, there is no uh, discipline when you can make an extra dollar. But I, I agree on the, um, on the demand side. Uh, 
and you know we all see the numbers what's happened since covid and we all see what's happening with the airplanes in the sky more and more planes are coming and uh you know people coming back to work and the inventories is what we watch and the market's in complete backwardation i think it's in record backward record backwardation which just forces people to consume the oil in front of them now and the uh, inventories are as low as possible there the people lose money by holding oil so that combined with the and backwardation and the energy storage looks at two things, commercial storage and um, uh, government storage, and they're both at record lows. So even if uh, demand doesn't go up as fast as we want on an actual basis, those inventories need to be replaced quickly. Good, very good. Um, so we started talking about We started talking about risk reward, and um, that's the whole point. Actually, with the crude tanker market today, it's a ten thousand dollars per day. You know, how much lower is it going to get? With the outlook that we are seeing, the facts we've gone through, not you know, hoping or dreaming or anything. It's it's nearly, you know. It's tempting to say that, you know, shoot for the moon, because even if you miss, you will land among stars. That's how, you know, the risk reward looks today. And when you look at the tanker stocks or the tanker vessel values, you know, you have that hanging belly, which we all saw in containers, which obviously now is completely flipped. The other set around, yes, Bob, you're, you're, you're perfectly positioned there. 10, 12, the biggest discount. So you should be, you should be really fine. Um, dry cargo, it's now flat. With the outlook, zero ships, 24, zero ships, 25. It's not going to stay like this. That's for sure. So um, final words of advice, Leon? You know, we see that inflation is at an all-time high. Interest rates are going up. <clears throat> Energy prices uh, are really high, as well as electricity. Real estate values have peaked and might be softening. So in the US, we might be in a recession. And uh, we always have to be a little bit prudent. You know, we have a strong balance sheet. We have repaid our debt. I would advise everybody to invest in companies with uh, low LTV, good balance sheet, great management team and you know younger assets and my opinion is that in a <coughs> inflationary environment real assets always outperform so shipping and especially tankers will do very well in this you know slowing macro environment where inflation might be high well said wise words bob um, our industry over a long period of time is a low return on capital, which is usually disappointing. And it's very, very efficient at replacing assets over time. And the only time we make a lot of money is when a couple of unforeseen events uh, come around at the same point in time. And we've had uh, you know, COVID, we've had the, the war, we've had enforced discipline on, on capital investments. We've become, a energy was a pariah or black energy was a pariah for a long period of time. So I think what's, what's happened recently, it's snapped in front of everyone's face and um, the demand will be there for a while, and we should have a really good year or two. Um, having said that, what brought us here were a couple of unexpected events, and what can take us away is a couple of unexpected events. So if I just look at the supply-demand lines going forward, it should be really, really, really good. Um, but of course, what'll uh, rule the day at the end is you know, what we don't expect. So I'm, I'm confident, and um, you know, we have all our money on the table. So I'm, uh, you're public. <laughs> So you can actually buy your stock. Uh, close to a billion dollars now. Last week you traded 100 million, you know, in the bottom of the market. So it's a pretty decent liquidity, I would say. Why should people buy DHT? Well, you know, this game of large tankers will never stop being cyclical. And uh, it is normally darkest just before dawn. So we are sort of in a, that type of uh, period, I think. And when earnings are shite, you know, $5,000, $10,000 a day, people uh, get worried. But if you look at DHT's performance over time, um, 
uh, I, you know, we are proud to say that we outperform our peer group. So consistently for the last five years in a row, every single year, our EBITDA margin is better than all of our peers. If you look at the total shareholder return for the same period, starting 1st of January 2017, same five-year period, we have the highest total shareholder return without sort of trying to trade the stock, just owning the stock and taking dividends. So we have a well-defined capital allocation policy. We paid tons of dividends in 2020 when the money, when the market was good, and you will expect that again next time. And uh, with the low leverage that we have, the low cost structure, it means the dividend capacity potential is huge in this company. So in the last upturn, we paid almost a quarter of our market cap in uh, over five quarters in dividends. I think that's pretty handy. So that's a good, good return for the investors. So focus on this not just about the being the biggest, that is not our ambition at all, it's our ambition to try to be one of the most respected and try to be the most profitable. And that's the way we think we can rever uh, reward our shareholders. Excellent, thank you very much. I think our time is, 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 is up, so uh, I guess final, final words is, um, as we've heard from these smart guys here, you know, changes in the tanker market happen just much, much quicker than you dare believe. We have seen it, and the beauty of this market is that cost is fixed. So there's just massive operational, obviously, leverage. At $100,000 per day rates for VLCCs, at $110 per barrel, it's less than $4 in transportation cost. Nothing. That's why we've seen 200 That's why we can see even higher. So buy tanker stocks. Now. <laughs> Thank you. We got it. <laughs>